Welcome back to the It's Just Sport podcast, A League of Our Own. I'm Joanna Reardon. I'm Neve Tallon, and today we have Chloe Mustaki with us here today. You are working and playing football. What is it like trying to balance everything at the moment? Yeah, it's it's um it's pretty insane. I mean, it's probably a schedule that I've been used to for a while now. Um, having worked kind of almost a year in England before coming home, um, when COVID hit, so. Uh, It's kind of been a different dynamic working from home and doing my rehab as opposed to working in an office and and training. So um, probably not quite as busy. Uh, I get a bit more sleep, which is welcomed, but uh, still kind of hectic managing the two. Um, But Unfortunately, that's just that's just the way it is at the moment. I was going to say, like, you know, like obviously I'm from Cork and like from Mill Street. So like GA is kind of in our blood and like any amateur athlete you talk to, that's the one thing they freak out about is just like sleep so they're always like we just need sleep to like recover like how are you you know obviously I know you mentioned about the the work-life balance but you know like what would be your kind of you know ways to kind of get yourself like switched off mentally from football and work yeah so um I suppose any downtime that I have outside the two I don't spend um focused on either one so for example like I wouldn't a lot of girls within the sport would spend a lot of time watching football matches and that's something that always surprises people when they ask me who do I support or who's my favorite player or any knowledge within the game I have very little of it and that's because I just choose to spend my downtime in different ways Mm -hmm. and just to kind of distract myself from whether it be sport or um yeah anything to do with work so I just I, I try and go and see friends I try and go for walks and listen to podcasts at the moment I'm doing a lot of that I try to read. Um, so, yeah, I I just, outside of those hours where I train and I work, I try and find other outlets. Yeah, you, that's that's just interesting. What are you listening to and reading to at the minute? Just because I'm nosy. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm listening a lot at the moment to the High Performance Podcast. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Yeah, I only discovered it a couple of weeks ago, and I'm pretty sure I've listened to every single one. So, um, I'm finding that really beneficial for uh, my own knee rehab. I just think it's it's important for me to you know glean from other people's tough experiences and how they've still managed to come out the other side and succeed through difficult mm-hmm. times. So I, I'm really I'm really enjoying that at the moment. And um, then what am I reading? I'm start I started the uh, Hearts Invisible Furies. Don't know if you've heard of that book. Uh, yeah, it's written by John Boyne. I think it is. Um, so it's based in Dublin which is mm-hmm. interesting um so yeah I'm, I'm I'm kind of open to to most things um but yeah anything to kind of keep my mind distracted but also keep me motivated on the task at hand mm-hmm. which is uh, getting back to soccer as as quickly as possible yeah tell us a bit about the 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 journey back at the moment how's everything going and when can we expect to see you on the pitch again yeah things are going relatively well um it's kind of just over a month or a year since I tore my ACL. So it's been a long road, um, to be honest. And I swear every time I get closer, it almost gets harder. And um, so, um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say exactly when I'll be back training. Um, hopefully kind of maybe a month from now, I just need to uh, listen to the knee and take it easy and uh, progress um, as it's as it's happy and as it says uh, yes that's fine with me uh, which is always is uh, which isn't always the case so yeah that's kind of where I'm at um obviously I won't be ready for the start of the season which is what 10 days from now but um been in and around the squad at shells uh good buzz around the place good buzz around the league um mm-hmm. lots of positives this year in women's football so yeah I'm happy to be kind of back involved in the national league here and I'm hoping to get back to my best as quickly as possible I was kind of like curious to know about the like the mental side of recovering like from an injury like especially like an ACL that it takes kind of so long and as you said you have to listen to the body more than your kind of intuition on yeah I just want to get back like you know I'm not I don't want like your in-depth rehab rehab process (laughs) how how are you you can tell me if you want but um like how did you like manage it like mentally you know like what did you find worked well um for you specifically yeah, so I I have to be honest, like I'm finding it much tougher now in these last few months than I did at the start. And mm-hmm. um, I why that is, I'm not really sure. I my knee's been particularly cranky, and um during times where maybe the league wasn't happening or when I was in the early stages of my rehab, um it was it felt normal and it felt 
I felt at peace with not playing. Um, but now that I'm kind of back running and I'm kind of in the later stages and the knee maybe one day might feel great while I do a run and then a week later, for whatever reason, it'll be cranky and it'll say, no, that's enough. It's kind of like it's trickier now because I'm so close, but I'm not there yet. And you don't want to rush it because you don't want to get back too soon. So that's really a mental battle at this stage. Um accepting that I'm not quite there yet and I don't want to put to waste all the good work that I've put over mm-hmm. the past 12 months yeah. by going back too soon and touch wood <laughs> tearing it again so yeah. um yeah I definitely am struggling now um more than I was at the start so it's been really tough I won't lie um I won't bore you with details but yeah I mean I've I've just been leaning on professionals physio professionals mm-hmm other girls as well who have done it that I know in the league um to kind of ask their experiences um and I'm just yeah I don't know I'm just trying to be as resilient as I can I'm Mm -hmm. as I said I'm listening I've really really found a benefit from listening to um the high performance podcast and also the mindset mentor which is another podcast podcast on Spotify and just talks about kind of um I talked about some in previous interviews, but like mastering the reaction and how you have to be able to control your mind and that you can, you know, control the controllables. Um, mm-hmm. All of that, I'm trying my best to keep calm. It's, it's been really difficult, um, as I said, especially in the last few weeks, but trying to use different resources to kind mm-hmm. of um, keep my mind at bay and keep working hard. Uh, don't feel too bad. Like my first shadowing experience was over in England and I had to follow a professional footballer, come back from a knee injury, like an ACL. And it was like, I mean, there were days you were just sitting there and he'd just start crying. You're like, oh, so now is not really the time to ask you a question, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I was I was talking to um, Dave O'Connor, the, the S&C coach at Shells yesterday. And I mean, I don't even know what my emotions are going to be like when I get back on that pitch and I play those Mm -hmm. first few minutes. I mean, I could cry any time of the day at the moment thinking about like how tough the past year has been. So I really, yeah, it's it's been an emotional journey and I'm, I'm kind of excited, but also (laughs) wary as to what I'll feel like kind of a a rush of emotions when I get back. So, um, yeah, but that's all part of it. It's the, the last few hurdles and then hopefully everything goes to plan and, and we'll see you back in action soon. But I mean, in relation to what you've been saying about the, the teams and everything, it seems like there's a lot of hype and, and, and good news in the, the Women's National League. So you've obviously moved back to Ireland and, and re-signed for Shelbury. Um, yourself and Saoirse Noon will be big additions to the squad. Um, so how, how excited are you for you know the season ahead? Yeah, I'm extremely excited. Um We've made some great signings this season and not to also ignore this, you know, the girls that were already there in past season. So we've a really, really mm-hmm. good squad. Um, we always have, to be honest, but, you know, the extra additions and the bit of change in management and just a bit of, I suppose, um, new life into the team will definitely help. And yeah, look, as you mentioned as well, all the changes in the league this year, like having the SSE Artricity sponsorship um removing the fact that you know we've all had to play and uh, pay in previous seasons to play like not having to do that anymore so some really positive changes so kudos to everyone involved and um, be, be at the FAI or the Women's National League everyone behind the scenes has worked hard now to make a change and to improve the conditions um for everyone playing in it so it's an exciting mm-hmm. year for me to come back um and I, I'm really looking forward to it. and hopefully when I'm when I'm back and playing to my best I can I can help the team out. Yeah, there's been uh, two in a row for P-Mount and Shelburne have had wins before that. So it, it'll be a challenge on your hands, but something that it, it, it sounds like the, the right team is there to, to give it a good go. Yeah, look, I think we're hungrier than ever. Um, it's been it's been pretty hard for Shells over the past couple of seasons to narrowly miss out. So, uh, you know, not just us, but I think other teams across, you know, across the league have really improved. Um mm-hmm. And, you know, you can even see in, in the friendly matches and stuff, like it's, it's it's really competitive. And the likes of UCD Waves, Galway and all, they'll be right up there as well contending. So it should be a really good season, really competitive one, um, but one where we're definitely hoping to to, to win this time around. <laughs> How, like, important is that for the league to have, like, people, like, competing? You know, obviously, it's never really been, like, a whitewash, like, per se. But, you know, it's good. It, like, surely it's good for competition for international places and, you know, for to like retain girls to, to stay here rather than go abroad. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we've really lacked uh, over the past, however, 10 years it's been now, right, since Women's National League started, yep. it's just resources and, and support. And unless we get that backing, we're not going to be able to progress um, the way other European countries are in terms of women's football. So um, just, you know, that support and also getting affiliated with men's clubs, all of that really helps um, to just push the women's game forward. So definitely there is a change in attitude this season, which is brilliant to see. I don't know, is that because we were so close to qualifying with the women's national team and mm-hmm. it's kind of spurred, um, you know, that energy on to to helping you know, the domestic league progress as well. So who knows really, but it's a great thing to see. And um, hopefully, hopefully we'll see uh, the positive effects of that kind of in the next 12 months. Is that kind of like frustrating that you have to see like something dramatic, like the women's national team almost qualify? You know, I know like the FA doesn't have a great real relationship with the leagues anyways in Ireland, but you know, is it is that what it's what's kind of needed is like something really dramatic to happen to get like the, the FAI's attention? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's been brewing for a few years now. Um, obviously, over the past kind of 18 months, the results of the women's team have, you know, have been really, really good. And it's it's unfortunate that it's taken all these girls to go abroad um, and bring that experience back to the women's team um, for, you know, to see change here. But it doesn't really matter at the end of the day what it takes. Um, we are where we are and we just need to look forward as opposed to, as opposed to kind of questioning why it hasn't happened mm-hmm. earlier. Um, so, look, obviously the FAI has had its own challenges over the past few years and that's probably um, prevented the women's game from, from progressing as quickly as other European countries. But it's good to see that it's happening now and we just need mm-hmm. to keep going and keep doing everything we can to showcase the talent that we have here in the country and helping the girls out to, to progress. Yeah, I think definitely you've mentioned a few things that have been progressing. And one of the things actually, um, you know, we saw in, in relation to Women's National League is that the the prize money has been increased. So, um, you know, we we saw that it was increased by 141%, uh, which brings it to 50,000 with the men's prize money being at 600,000. So obviously, you know, there's there's an increase there which is brilliant and you know we have to be realistic in you know where where the women's game is at the moment and you know what you talk about is, is things are moving forward which is brilliant but what's it like playing football as a woman in Ireland um, and and kind of being involved in that and you know is there anything in particular that you think needs to be done or you know could be done um, not necessarily from the FAI or the powers that be but from like the general public that can help like really bring women's football to the fore? Yeah. Um, well, the one thing that will be great to see this year is obviously now um, they're streaming all the women's games well mm-hmm. on, on League of Ireland. Yeah. Here, uh, whatever the link is, probably I don't really know the term. Uh, but <laughs> at, at least, at least you know, anyone in the public will be able to watch women's football now. I'm sure with that will come some negative feedback. I mean, there's always individuals out there who want to pick on women's sport and there will be kind of some bad comments as well, but it it will showcase some of the great players that we have as well at the same time. And that, you know, that should in itself help to kind of promote the league. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, potentially as well, the fact that all other or most other sports aren't um, active at the moment. So soccer is kind of one of the only sports at the moment in Ireland under COVID that luckily has Mm -hmm. been allowed to keep playing so there's a lack of sport on at the moment so maybe we can capitalize on that as well and have more spectators watching online because as I said there's not much going on so yeah there's a few different factors that may play um into our into our favor so we'll see what happens you know it is you know, it is still kind of something that's progressing in Ireland and you'll always have kind of women's ga or other sports that are just more popular, um, you know, but it is it is improving. And if we can, you know, if we can just keep building on the steps that have come into play this season, uh, hopefully we can we can compete with other European countries, maybe kind of mm-hmm. five years from now. It's, you know, it's 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 looking good. 
Yeah, like as I always say, like even if you can just grab like the core like groups of, of fans, as you said, being affiliated with men's teams, you know, from a Cork City perspective, if you could just get like, I'm not, I'm not saying we want the ultras at women's games, but I think it would be kind of fun. Um, but, you know, if you could just get that core support group that are already kind of there, at least, you know, that's, you know, a couple of thousand maybe that might necessarily have been have known what's kind of going on before. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, touching on what I already mentioned, I think it's really important if we can try and push for the women's National League clubs to be affiliated with men's because, as you said, there's overlapping support and also just connections between the men's team and the women's team breed support for each other. And then on social media, that gets attention. So let's say people follow some of the men's team and the men's team try and support on social media some of the Mm -hmm. women's games and stuff and some of their supporters will see that and will you know will tune in so yeah I think that's a really important step um and it's one that will be really important necessary to kind of push the women's game forward as opposed to trying to find funds to to support um independent female Mm -hmm. clubs do you think like it should go like the way kind of Arsenal and Man City are at the minute where like it's a one account kind of for all? Or do you think like the women should have, I'm not saying like a different identity on social media, but do you think like, I'm not saying the divide should be there as well, but like that you can differentiate, you know what I mean? Like it's not going to be all, I don't know, whoever's playing for shells like men's is dominating like the, the main social media account. And then, you know, the likes of yourselves or Saoirse Noonan are like banging in goals, but none of that is tweeted. <laughs> but whereas if you had a separate men and women's account, that wouldn't necessarily be happening yeah it's kind of not something i've really thought about to be honest i don't i don't know how we think about it (laughs) yeah we think about it a good bit but that's because we're on the on the media side of things so it's something that we've kind of talked about a bit we also have no life chloe like this is all we spend our time doing (laughs) you have you're doing a great job honestly we're so thankful anyone who plays you know involved women's foot in women's sport in ireland is really really thankful for all the work that you do so keep it up honestly um I don't know like I in a way I have thought about what difference it has to have separate social media accounts for your women's and men's team like a stupid comment to make maybe is like sometimes it is hard to differentiate which team you're talking about if you're looking at tweets Mm -hmm. and stuff which can be a bit confusing um I don't really see the harm in having two separate ones. I like the idea of making it one club name as opposed Mm -hmm. to kind of having men's and like Shell's men's football club and Shell's women's football club. I like the Mm -hmm. the idea of unifying the name. In terms of social media, I don't think it's it's harmful to have two separate accounts just to clarify things, but it's not something, as I said, it's not something that I've looked um, into too much. So um, I'll (laughs) I'll probably refrain from saying anything else. Yeah, You'll be going to do your research now to to go back and be like, okay, this is what I've... No, look, it's a hard hard thing. Um, You know, I think... Um, when we look at like national governing bodies like in my opinion certainly like the national governing bodies should all be showing unified front because they're supposed to be there for every athlete but when you're looking at at, at clubs like um, and, and other things it's it's like you're saying I think it's you get you're, you're talking about the language and um, so if it's say um, you know the the Irish women's football team then they should be saying the Irish men's football team that's what people think that would help take away that confusion yeah um but yes like you're talking about the the kind of separate social accounts like um you know the IRFU run their social accounts as as one um but then you look at hockey where it's Irish hockey and then it's the Irish women's hockey team so um it it's I think sometimes um the women's side is forced a little bit to actually create their own accounts to get that recognition because on on some accounts whether it's a you know, NGB or whether it's a club uh, aren't actually doing the women's teams justice. Um, so, I mean, if it takes creating another account just to get the content out yeah. there, at least you'd be, getting, you'd be getting in front of people and you know for sure that the content's getting out there. But in an yeah. ideal world, it would all be, uh, you know, through kind of one account and, and a club or an NGB would be representing, um, you know, both the, the men and women fairly. But uh, yeah, it's it's one that you can you can jump into. And, and yeah, it is, there's no right or wrong answer. You know, people are just trying their best, I think. But um, yeah, I think you need I, resources as well. I think you need resources. Yeah. If you're going to make it the one account, you need you need people who are going to be active on them all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so the bigger the club, the more opportunity you have to do that. Social media is a full time yeah. job. 
like yeah that, no <laughs> like like i know people mock influencers and stuff like that all the time like it stresses me out if i have to post something because i want it to be like correct yeah like god no, forbid i've ever asked god forbid i'm ever asked to do something like actually worthwhile as a job with it I, i'd be like i i can't <laughs> oh absolutely <laughs> just... i mean my, i i have never even once checked my screen time because it's probably disgraceful and that's oh, yeah. from someone who <laughs> like works an office job so like i can't imagine if you're you know, if your job is social media, it's like you'd, you'd have to be on it all the time. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 no, it's tough. It's tough. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, I wanted to ask a little bit about kind of what you think of the setup in the States. And obviously women's soccer is like at a, you know, an all time high really over there at the moment. And, you know, they have the support, the infrastructure. Um, it's not necessarily, it's kind of like the flip over there. Um, and yeah what is there anything there that you've seen that we could replicate to kind of increase interest support or funding um of our female footballers yeah i think the main difference in the states is that um the interest in women's football starts at collegiate level so Mm -hmm. there's a lot of money that goes into women's football at college level and from there Mm -hmm. the women push on to professional status so like across I mean, college, college soccer in Ireland is like for women anyway, is it's just quite poor. Um, Mm -hmm. Why that is, I'm not really sure. I just it's not really a sport that um, is really pushed. I I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. It's not really a sport that's really pushed um, in many colleges, I think. Like, um, so I I, I don't know. I just think that that's the main difference that I've noticed is that most girls who, you know, who get drafted in the end of MSL come from big colleges, big soccer colleges. Um, so it, yeah, I suppose if we could get more scholarships on offer for women's soccer across Ireland, that could potentially um, increase then the output in terms of our women's national league. So, but then again, you want girls playing the women's national league from a younger age, you know, before they even get to college. So mm-hmm. um, it'll all come as, as fo- women's football in Ireland progresses and, and more funding goes into it, more scholarships and um, more players, more interest. So, yeah, I mean, I, other than that, like, yeah, as you said yourself, like women's football is, is actually stronger than men's football in the States, probably because other sports in the men's on the men's side of things um, trump soccer. So like you have obviously American mm-hmm. football and um, others, you know, hockey, anything like ice hockey, anything like that where it, it's kind of more of interest um for men so i don't know that would be kind of my view on it um, and yeah. but again america has a lot of money to spend and they like to spend it on sports so um, and yeah. that's you know that's worked to their advantage as well in terms of women's soccer i think as well yeah, like the difference like the thing that i you know as much as i'd like to replicate an american system here is that like soccer in America isn't very accessible, you know, like, you know, from everything I've heard, like if you want to do a camp with like Megan Rapino as an example, you have to pay up to five grand. So okay. like already, already you're like kind of discriminating against, you know, like, you know, a, a specific economic group that might, you know, have a, a flair and might have a different style of like soccer, you know, to bring to the Americas. Whereas look, I'm not saying like here it's kind of perfect, but at least you have an FAI Academy that's kind of accessible for kind of those on the fringes of like society and things like that. But I think, as you were saying, like the structures are in place. I was actually kind of thinking in my head as you were answering, you know, because obviously in the NWSL, they have this like, uh, like celebrity groups like coming together and a party was like I wonder like who in Ireland could you have like a celebrity like group like funding a team like what would happen <laughs> yeah yeah well there you go you you obviously you've done your research and um you have a, you know you have a better knowledge on, on it but yeah I, I don't know I don't know like we have a long way to go here um mm-hmm. and it really needs to start from a young age and you know but it's it's step by step so we can only we can only do one thing at a time and I think the priority right now is to uh, improve the women's national league and then we can start to look further down the stages yeah like I was going to say like probably from a league perspective that's the first visible thing you'll see so if you see the standard of that growing the impact will happen on younger generations as well you know especially as you said it's free to air on the league of Ireland 
platform now so should be good I was kind of interested in you know your your kind of story I suppose as, as a whole so I know you've been involved with the Irish setup you know you captained throughout underage level um I suppose you know you had kind of like kind of tough times as well you know you, you know you were sick you did your time away um so many kind of different things I was just kind of wondering for anyone who doesn't doesn't know can you just kind of go go through it and kind of give us a, a quick run through because I suppose at the end of the day like I mean the story is it's quite it's one of dedication and you know I hate the word inspiration but it is like for anyone who's listening <laughs> yeah yeah sure I appreciate that um yeah so look I I grew up um playing for Ireland through the ranks so at under 15s under 17s and then under 19s and then luckily 2014 I captained the under 19s Irish women's team to uh, their first ever European finals in July in Oslo which was fantastic experience and mm -hmm. we kind of went in to that tournament with everyone thinking you know we probably wouldn't make it past the group stages we'd probably lose all of our games we had Spain England and Sweden um if I remember correctly and we ended up you know getting through that stage through you know with flying colors um and everyone was you know ecstatic so we made it to the semi-final unfortunately we we lost that against the eventual winners um Netherlands who were a strong outfit but mm -hmm. so yeah obviously tournament of my life like really proud moment and um, fantastic experience um so I came home from that the end of July 2014 and a couple of weeks later I went in for um a checkup with my GP who happened to ask to take my bloods routinely um and then it just so transpired um that I actually had late stage two lymphoma um so I'd been feeling kind of tired and a bit off throughout the the, the, the months coming up to it. Um, but I just put that down to kind of training, getting ready for the finals. And yeah, it turned out I had, um, yeah, I had a type of blood cancer. So that was a, a major shock to the system at the time, obviously being, I had just turned 19. Um, so I, yeah, I started a six month chemotherapy um, phase of, of treatment um in, from September to February and thankfully um I, you know I went into remission then everything everything looked well um so so yeah and then it just was about kind of getting back into normal life and um, I had taken I decided to take the year out of college um I was meant to go into my second year of college that September but I took the year out um and I went I you know I think I played my first game back uh, for for UCD kind of a month after my last treatment or so or about six weeks after so um it was great I was able to kind of keep up a bit of training throughout which was the one thing that you know kept me sane while going and um, while going through what I was going through despite the body taking quite a big hit and um, with the chemo sessions mm -hmm. but yeah so it was it was kind of a world with whirlwind experience I didn't have time to think I just got through it um and then yeah just went back to college then the next year and that's when things kind of hit me really um trying to reintegrate to you know into what was supposedly my my normal life um but it wasn't really normal after the year that I had just gone through and um, so I was trying to go back to you know college and go back to football and it all was a bit much so um I remember that was a tough period for me but yeah all in all it was you know it was an experience thankfully I'm I'm here to tell the tale and hopefully um you know it'll never come back and you know as I as I look and hear stories from other athletes now over the past few years I'm not the only one who's you know been dealt a, a crap card like that and just as recently as a couple of weeks ago there was a, a Brighton um female soccer player who was uh, diagnosed with Hodgkin's Hodgkin's lymphoma as well so I think she's gone back to Australia or New Zealand where, she, where she's from to to get treated so um I think it came as a massive shock because I was so young and at that stage mm -hmm. no one else kind of across the sports scene in Ireland um you know had been affected by something like that so but now as I get older um unfortunately that's just life and more and more people at our age you know get you know are affected by these things and um, even if you're as healthy as an athlete you still unfortunately um be it through your genes or anything like that can be affected so yeah it's definitely it was a tough time but it's it's made me more resilient and strong and mm -hmm. it's definitely um it's definitely helped me 
well, initially in the first stages of after tearing my ACL, it led me to kind of have a good perspective on things and to, you know, just accept that it was another bump in the road. And, you know, I was, I was going to come back from this and I, you know, I'd be fine. Um, I have to be honest and say like the past year has mentally has probably been somewhat tougher. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's hard to say that because, with anything after a long time you kind of forget exactly how bad you were feeling at the time so mm-hmm. while I'm saying six or seven years on this past year has been tougher than the year I went through my chemo and um, I probably can't say that with too much certainty but definitely from a mental perspective I've really found the past year tough and um, especially going through it you know during COVID where yeah I didn't have access to everything I needed I didn't I couldn't I couldn't go out and release that kind of frustration. I couldn't, um, I couldn't really do anything. I was working from home. I was on my own a lot. Um, I was going to the, you know, I've been doing everything on my own without, you know, the benefit of a team around me up until last month. So, um, but definitely from a physical standpoint, obviously the hit that my body took going through chemo was, was definitely uh, quite tough. So mm-hmm. Yeah, lots and uh, lots learned at a young age. Um, probably not a bad thing. Um, would I have preferred not to have experienced these two um, tough periods? Absolutely, but unfortunately, everyone gets dealt bad cards and just need to keep going. Um, and yeah, so that's my story to date. Um, bit of a different one, but. Uh, hopefully I'm hoping to kind of come back uh, stronger now mm-hmm. and I, I've worked I've worked hard so hopefully yeah uh, hopefully I'll be able to see that over the next few months I think that's what's like really impressive is like you've gone through so much and you're still seeking that Irish cap you're still pushing hard um you know on on the football stage and, and really going for it so you know is that is that something that you're hoping will come through this year that we'll we'll get to see in in that kind of Irish setup again as a as a senior yeah, look, um, that's my number one goal and ambition. Um, I've been fighting towards it since I was 13 years of age, since I st- first first played for Ireland. So, um, look, unfortunately, there's just been bumps in the road for me and I haven't been able to get there yet. But I have to be realistic as well. I made choices to, um, to prioritise my education at times where maybe I could have tried to go, you know, full time earlier and maybe I would have managed to get that cap before. So, you know, I don't really have any regrets, but they're just the choices that I've made. And mm-hmm. now I am where I am and I, you know, have, I'm kind of uh, further along um, the career, I'd say, where I have not that many years to try and get there uh, as may, may, maybe other players might have um, from a younger age. So look, um, still plenty of fight and energy in me. And I, I'd like to hope that I might be able to get that cap before the end of 2021. Um, I know obviously the World Cup qualifiers are coming up um, the first round, I think, in August or September. So whether or not I'll be back playing to my best by then, um, I don't know, but I'll definitely um, work towards that. Brilliant. We we hope we hope to see you get that that shot and 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 get some of the action. Um, it'd be brilliant to see you back out in the Irish gear. I know you've done a, a bit more in in relation to punditry and that. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that what that experience has been like yeah so as they say when one door closes temporarily anyway and another one opens so yeah and um, so fortunately Garth Marr um who's involved with the women's national team um mm-hmm. media officer he um yeah he just he's given me so many opportunities over the past year so I have a lot to thank um at, for him so yeah it's been great it's been great um it's been very different it's been challenging in its own way especially coming from someone who hasn't spent much time watching football and um, so it's it's been a new challenge one that I've really enjoyed and it's added another string to my bow I suppose it's kind of made me somewhat interested in potentially kind of a, a media career who knows um but yeah no it's been fantastic and it was it was a way for me to kind of keep involved in in and around the Irish squad you know, especially in the early stages um, when we were still trying to qualify, it allowed me to still be involved and in and around kind of the team in a way. So it was fantastic. Um, but yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm not 
pushing for that right now. I have other interests at the moment that I'm still trying to pursue. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm I'm working a full time job in executive search, and um, which I've learned so much as a result. So, yeah, lots going on, but definitely a, a new experience for me and one that I that I really welcomed, um, especially going through kind of that that tough mental mental period. Is it kind of like a like a weird way of kind of carving an identity as well outside of actually like playing? Because I know a lot of people would kind of struggle when they retire they're like oh I've just been a footballer what do I do in my life whereas I know like you don't want to be like an amateur having to like pay to play or different things like that but is it kind of like a weird like kind of swap where you're like well actually I do have a life after football yeah yeah um I guess my whole focus um growing up has been not to put all your eggs in one basket and that's kind of why having a professional career outside football has been so important to me um I don't know I I don't know where that's come from maybe from you know my parents and um not having maybe a huge financial stability growing up um so yeah I I don't know whether I'll still be involved in football after I stop playing and the love for me comes from playing especially since as Mm -hmm. I said I don't really follow it or anything like that so it'll probably take a lot of work for me to pursue a career in punditry or commentary after I stopped playing because I haven't had too much experience um following the game otherwise but it's something that I could do and I could look into and it's great for me to have had that experience and a bit of a mm-hmm. taste of it to know kind of what it entails and everything and, and it's been really exciting it's been it's been really great and um it's broadened my network and stuff which is which is fantastic so um yeah who knows what's to come but um yeah it's great to kind of dip your toe in a few different things and mm-hmm. and, and try things out I think also you're talking about maybe not, you know, consuming football from from a, a fan and, and viewing perspective uh, while you're playing. But maybe you'll find that uh, might change if you um, if, if you're not playing as, as competitively, uh, you know, it, later in life that, that, you know, you might like to watch it and, and give that kind of advice and, and, and commentary and stuff. So maybe maybe that kind of uh, might change over over the years. Yeah. But, um, I mean, Vera Pa is, is signed on now, um, you know, to continue her um, relationship with Ireland ahead of the World Cup qualification campaign. Um, what do you think that means for the Irish setup and how exciting is it to be involved? Yeah, I think it's it's brilliant to see what we want and what we need is consistency. And we haven't really had that, um, unfortunately, with, with the women's team. So now you're looking at consistency, you're looking at um, commitment from the FAI, you're looking at better resources everything that you know we've needed to to you know to progress women's football here in Ireland and now we have girls that are playing abroad and bringing back really great experiences from their club to you know to help progress the the results and everything together should make a big difference like unfortunately we felt we we fell just short in terms Mm -hmm. of the European qualification but you have to think about it as well like Vera only had about a year or so to you know, to turn things around and, and get us qualified, which is not enough time, really. So um, it's great to have this run in now of a couple of years before the World Cup. And, you know, it's, you know, she she believes that we can get there. And, you know, that's a big mm-hmm. that's a big statement for her to make. And she has, you know, she says she has no doubt that we will get there. So um, to see that belief from your manager is is massively important. And I know that all the girls believe in her, Eileen and Jan, all the backroom staff, everyone supports each other. There's a great atmosphere about. So, yeah, if we can just con- can continue to have that support from the FAI and from from everyone at, at home, um, I, I have no doubt, really, that, you know, that we can be in the mix. Leo, we'll be off to Australia before we know it. I told you this. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's trying to get us to go on some international trips. She's just she's excited. But no, I think, look, it's been it's it's been a really exciting year, I think, for football. And there's definitely a lot of uh, moves in the right direction you know, from the the fan perspective, like there's, there's loads to watch, there's loads going on, uh, whether it's in Women's National League or, or um, you know, with the Irish setup, there's definitely a, a strong move in the right direction. Um, talk to us a little bit about the Irish setup in, I know that sometimes it's hard to get everybody together, um, which I think Vera has spoken a little bit about that, you know, obviously everybody's playing for clubs, if they, if they're, you know, after, you know, you don't necessarily have people everyone in Ireland you know people might be abroad playing like what's it like kind of being involved in that and then for people to come together 
uh, you know, have camps, you know, a bit of time to train together and then play on the pitch. Like, how difficult is that? Yeah, it's very difficult. It, it really is difficult, especially especially for us because we have we have some home base players who are not playing at the same level and intensity that some of the most of the girls are that are playing abroad. And if you think about maybe some of the other nations in Europe whose league might be, you know, quite a bit more advanced than ours. Like mm-hmm. a lot of those girls, if you look at the German league or the German team, like a lot of those girls are playing together in the same club. Like mm-hmm. the difference that that makes is huge. Like those girls are training with each other week in, week out. Um, and of course, that's going to transfer onto their national team as well. So the the quicker that we improve the league here in Ireland, um, the sooner we will see, I think, results, um, you know, in our in our in our national squad as well. So. Yeah, look, you can't, you know, everyone is put on the same circumstances as well to an extent, you know, mm-hmm. everyone has players playing in different countries around the world and, you know, they only have a few days together as well before they have to play. But generally speaking, their leagues are more advanced, so they might have more players playing together at a higher level. And also nearly all their, like probably 100% of the nations that we want to be competing with, all their girls are full-time. So Mm-hmm. It's a bit of a different mix. Like we're still a bit behind and um, we are getting there and, and a lot more of our players are moving abroad and are playing with, with fantastic clubs. And as I said, are bringing that experience back with them into the national team camps, but we're still, a, you know, we're still a bit behind and um, it'll probably take another couple of years to, to see, you know, to see the difference it makes in, 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 in putting resources into the league here and into the women's team here. So yeah, but look, every national team is is given the same kind yeah. of international window. So you, to an extent, you can't really you can't really complain. But um, there are slight differences that, in the end, make make a big difference overall. Mm-hmm. And you kind of it's always to... something that <laughs> <laughs> it's my internet. It's, no, it's always something. <laughs> no, it's always something that's interested me about football. Is that obviously everybody plays in different places than you like pull a team together and everyone has to kind of you know there might be different kind of approaches and strategies in in your clubs and then everyone has to kind of come together and then play for your national team and you know I think there's lots of people that talk about kind of representing their country and how much it means and 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 that type of thing and um you know people obviously uh you know pull together and and have some really good results but um yeah we look forward to kind of seeing what's going to happen over over the next few years and um in in relation to that that, yeah uh, that's the the important thing like brilliant when you have sorry when you have a build-up of a couple of years where you have the same cohort Mm -hmm. of girls and the same management that's what you need to get results and that's what we have now Mm -hmm. going into the world cup so it'll be really interesting to see you know how the qualification campaign goes for that because we have a year under our belt now and we have you know really good core group of girls um who are talented and and there's a real good buzz around the team and stuff so Mm -hmm. It, it seems as though everything is coming together and we have, you know, we have everything we should need to to, to really compete and try and get there now. Sorry, I cut you off there. No, that's fine. Um, did you ever play any other sports or did you always have a, a huge passion for football? Yeah, so I, I played uh, tennis competitively um, up until about 14 as well, 13, 14. And then mm-hmm. at that stage when I had kind of gotten selected for the Irish team, I just made the decision to to let go of the tennis, but I did really enjoy it, and I played it quite competitively as well. Um, but unfortunately, between school and 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 soccer, just I couldn't do everything. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of sports I wish I had played, like the likes of of hockey or um, camogie. Like those are two sports I wish I had played, and I I actually love watching them. Um, I was even you know I was watching the hockey girls. I actually don't know if they what the score final score was today. Uh, it was one all. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um. So there you go. Uh, I would know some of the hockey girls from from being at UCD, but yeah. So, um, yeah, those two sports I definitely wish I'd played, but otherwise didn't uh, didn't dip my toe in, in, in too many sports. Um, mm-hmm. just because I got I got uh, up and running with soccer quite quickly. So. Mm-hmm. And in relation to school, I know you were in St. Andrews and there was kind of a, a lot going on with soccer for the boys. Was that ever something that you got involved in or was it very much kind of a segregated situation where boys played football and girls didn't really get involved? Yeah, um, no, I didn't play. I didn't. 
So Andrews, um, I think they might have had like, I don't think they had a competitive soccer team as far as I remember, but the, mm-hmm. the major two sports in, in my school were um, hockey and rugby. Talk, talk about typical South Dublin school. <laughs> um, but um, again, I had made the move to Andrews in fourth year and I was well, kind of well up and running and established with my soccer at that stage. So um, it wouldn't it wouldn't really have made sense to kind of try and get going with hockey or anything like that. But mm-hmm. um the sports, yeah, I mean, the sports at that age are, are already segregated, so there was no real overlap between between the men and the women. But, um, but yeah, it was quite a quite a, a, a sporting school as well. Like they did try mm-hmm. and push that on on the students too. To yeah, I think like I've sorry, no, I we just <laughs> go go. <laughs> sorry, this this happens sometimes. No, just in relation to to I like I've spoken about like I came from an all-girls school I know people have come from from mixed schools and that type of thing and you know I know certainly in the in the boys school where I'm from that they would have played football at lunchtime and that type of thing and that was just never something that really happened um for us and I guess from from somebody that can obviously obviously play football and and if there's football kind of going on like it was just wondering if there was something that you kind of got involved in like like, like we never did any training at lunchtime like it was always like you know sitting around and chatting and like all the, like from primary school and secondary school like um we weren't allowed to run there's never any football or anything going on um even in primary school or secondary school and like we played hockey but rarely did people go out and play hockey or or a ga or anything like that it just wasn't the done thing where yeah. in the boys schools it was totally normal so i guess from a mixed school perspective and um obviously like say the the competitive sports um you know or priorities might have been say hockey and um and rugby and andrews but I, I know there's a, a bit of football that goes on maybe between classes and stuff. And yeah. yeah, just yeah. just kind of from that perspective, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, being in a mixed school is is great and has many advantages. Um, I I mean, <laughs> I used to be asked to play. I used to be asked by the guys all the time to play in their kind of five sides or whatever. And um, that's something I'm really used to. But I never really got involved. Um, it's kind of daunting as a girl, you know, to be you know to be the only girl who plays and I just I never kind of just allowed myself to get involved I just Mm -hmm. I I, it wasn't really for me um and as I said already before like I played so much football like girl you know I I'm football consumes half of my life you know and I want to be you know I want to be chatting with my friends at lunchtime I want to be kept you know when you're a teenager you like Mm-hmm. To live off gossip what you know what happened at the party at the weekend like you know um and and to this day my school friends are you know are my best friends and I love them to bits so um nah I, I never really got involved in in playing football with the guys at lunchtime um but I mm-hmm. I was frequently asked yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's good at least they were being inclusive and uh you know they knew where the talent was uh, yeah. yeah 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 no that's the thing about being in a mixed school is real good camaraderie between the you know the girls and the boys but, but unless it was kind of like a, a sports day thing or anything like that mm-hmm. like there wouldn't be too much overlap uh, between yeah, the two yeah. in relation to I know obviously you've kind of touched a little bit on, on playing with boys then I'm I know Vera has plans I think to to play against some um younger teams some youth teams and that and um, what do you think of that it's I think it's an interesting concept about um, you know bringing forward the women's side to play against um some some boys teams um at, at whatever age group I don't know how far up uh, she's going to go but it's it's certainly an interesting concept yeah um and to be honest it's actually not something that's too new I mean from I think back mm-hmm. from when I was I started playing with the Irish team we used to always have friendlies against boys team and I really really do back it I mean if you talk to mm-hmm. any most girls um in this generation you know who have who have been successful in soccer have started off playing with boys um and it's because you just learn technically you learn so much quicker and by being put you know in a an environment where you know where people are are physically quicker and you know they they're just they're used to playing football day in day out with their mates like you say um so being being put with you know around a team of boys really does improve your skills quicker so I think I think the fact that she's emphasizing that is is great and even when I was involved with the team last year you know we played boys on several occasions before playing um qualifying games 
um, just gets you sharp um, and gets you ready for, you know, top female opposition. So um, I think it's a great idea and, you know, it's it's great that she's trying to push it. Um, I don't know whether, yeah, I don't know the details of that because, as I said, I haven't really been involved in the chat um, with, with the squad given I've been injured. So I don't know what the details are, but I did see something written about it in, in, in on social media. So I think it's brilliant and I mean, even if you if if everyone can be trying to kind of get some training time with boys, that would be great as well. Obviously, now with COVID, it's a bit of a difficult situation, but um, mm-hmm. I think it's great to see. Yeah, no, like I mean, it was all like everything you said there was um, was incredibly interesting. Like I mean, I was nodding in agreement because I was in a mixed school as well, and like you said, it, it is kind of weird for a teenage girl to like just go out for lunch at like halftime or lunchtime and just kind of kick around. Like it's just not really a mm-hmm. done thing so um yeah no overall I'm I'm out of questions me really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I think I think he gave some really interesting insights and I uh, thanks Emil for taking the, the time to chat to us I'm um, we're certainly wishing you all the best with the the rest of the recovery keep the head up you know you're nearly there the last few hurdles I'm sure you'll get over them in no time and we'll see you back in action soon and uh we're certainly rooting for you so and um, thanks again for for taking the time to chat to us yeah no problem and look thank you both and anyone else who's behind her sport obviously as I said at the start you know you guys are what makes the difference in promoting women's you know women's sport in Ireland so you know we owe our gratitude to you so um thank you for all the work that you do and again thank you for taking interest in in my own story as well